Hey guys, by the way, next time you can choose what I review. I will either review an R7 250, an R7 360, or a GTX 750. I'm hoping for an R7 360 because that's the newest. So leave your choices in the comments below and I will get to that next. But today we will be taking a look at Nvidia's newest graphics card, the GTX 950. Now I got the EVGA for the win version. On the front we see it is an EVGA GeForce GTX 950 with 2 gigabytes of GDDR5 memory, which is the norm for 1080p gaming. You get dynamic super resolution, which is really freaking cool. You can set your resolution with even with a 1080p monitor to 2715 by 1527 or even 4K. You're not actually increasing your pixel count you're really still on a 1080p monitor. And on the bottom, we see features like GameStream, GameWorks, G-Sync, and DirectX 12. You also see this card comes with the backplate and it's EVGA's ACX 2.0 cooler, which looks really good. On the back, we see features like dynamic super resolution, as I mentioned earlier, MFAA, GameWorks, GameStream, G-Sync, DirectX 12, GPU Boost 2.0, Adaptive V-Sync, NVIDIA Surround, support for four displays, SLI up to only a two-way configuration, CUDA, of course, PCI Express 3.0, of course, OpenGL 4.5 support, and OpenCL support and EVGA Precision X 16 included for free. Now let's take a look at the beauty of this card. The ACX 2.0 cooler looks really good and I absolutely love the inclusion of a backplate for this $190 graphics card. It makes the card noticeably heavy but there certainly isn't any drooping in your case. There is a dual BIOS switch for if you goof up your unnecessary modifications or overclock. And this card requires only an 8-pin PSU cable. And it even comes with a 2-6-pin to an 8-pin connector. And the card has a max power draw of 125 watts. So it will be recommended you have at least a 350 watt power supply. I'm certainly not the first person you're watching doing a review of the GTX 950, so I'm basically saying the exact same thing. There's not much else to say differently. This is a cut down version, basically, of a 960. She has 768 CUDA cores, a base clock of 1203 MHz, a boost clock of 1405 MHz, 2 GB of GDDR5 memory clocked at 6610 MHz on a 128-bit memory interface. There is a max resolution of 5120 by 3200 yeah. Now we can talk about how this card performs. We're testing our usual games, Shadow of Mordor, Bioshock Infinite, and Tomb Raider 2013 on three different test benches. The first test bench has an i5-4670K stock, so at 3.4 GHz quad-core processor with 16 GB of RAM. The test bench 2 has an i3, 3.7 GHz, so it's an i3-4170 with 8 GB of RAM. And on our third bench, we have the Pentium G3258 dual-core, 3.2 GHz with 4 GB of RAM. So there's just three test benches, so if you decide you have a higher-end system, you can look at those numbers, rather than if you have a lower-end system, you kind of match yours with the Pentium. Or somewhere in between, like a 6-core AMD processor, you can look at the i3's benchmarks and apply that to you. I ran each bench three times and then took the average. On Tomb Raider Ultimate settings at 1080p, the i5, actually all three got a minimum of 30 FPS, and very much the maximum stayed at around 60. On the G3258, for some reason, it got the 61.3. The, the i5 4670K got a 48 average. The i3 got a 47.5 average. And the G3258 Pentium got a 46.3 average. So I was very aware Tomb Raider was mainly a GPU benchmark but maybe the amounts of RAM have a small difference here, like 4 gigs to 8 gigs. On Shadow of Mordor at very high, at 1080p, we're seeing a minimum of 44.1, an average of 56.4, and a maximum of 104 on the i5. On the i3, we're seeing a minimum of 40, so 4 FPS less than the i5. 56, so the same as the i5, and 76.3, so something happened there within the benches that made the i3 perform worse at a max 
FPS, which was kind of weird. Now the Pentium got four less than the i3, so eight less than the i5 for the minimum. 59, so a little bit better than the, the other averages, and 95.7 as the maximum. So you're seeing a little bit performance difference, but it's kind of playing leapfrog because the i3 can't really reach past 70, but not that you're gonna need the high of frame rate if you're playing on a 60 hertz or even overclocked 70 hertz monitor. And lastly, on Bioshock Infinite, we're seeing around 90, around mid 90s to higher 90 FPS as the max. We're seeing about 66, 67 for the averages and 56 for the minimums, except for the Pentium, which landed at 51 FPS. Now I'd like to bench this on other games as well, but I don't have that many other games that have benchmarks or that are even that much more demanding than this. Shadow of Mordor can get very demanding with its high resolution texture pack, but as you can see, uh, this configuration even being the Pentium plus the GTX 950 was no problem running Shadow of Mordor on very high. Now I couldn't run Ultra on Shadow of Mordor. It decided that there wasn't enough VRAM or something that might have been the problem, but it recommended I turn the settings down to very high, which is still looks very good. In conclusion, this card is very, very nice. The ACX cooler looks really nice. It's super thin. I love it. I forgot to describe I.O. earlier. It has one DVI, three display ports, and one HDMI. Tell me what you think about this card in the comments below. Please leave a like, and if you enjoy what I do, you might as well hit subscribe if you want to see more. Please leave me a suggestion of which of those three cards you want to see next. The R7 360, the R7 250, or the GTX 750. I will do any one of those three cards that you ask. See you guys next time. But today we will be looking at NVIDIA's newest graphics card, the GTX 750. 